Hey folks, I've heard many Warlock tank players say that they're struggling to hold threat in dungeons, but with the build that I've been running, this hasn't been an issue at all. In this video, I'll walk you through all parts of the special build that I've been using for dungeons so that you never need to worry about multi-target threat again. Okay, so first up, we're going to talk about the runes. Now, there are some obvious ones, right? Metamorphosis goes on your hands. And then for the chest, I'm running Master Channeler. Now, I've seen some debate about Lake of Fire, especially in dungeons. This is incorrect, and later on I will kind of touch upon why it is incorrect to take Lake of Fire, but I would say most people can understand why Master Chandler is really good. It's run by most people in most content. It is going to be your best bet for dungeons, so we'll kind of touch upon this later. The main thing that I want to talk about is I am running Everlasting Affliction on legs, and if you have one takeaway from this video, that should be it. Now, the main reason why I think this rune is criminally underrated by a lot of people is it is from the new reputation from Waylaid Supplies. I have a guide on how to reach Honored with that. Right now, though, you actually only need Friendly. They lowered the requirement for this rune. So it's actually really, really easy to get now. And I've talked about how this rune is really good even in raids. I've been running it in Black Fathom Deeps. I explained my raiding build in a separate video, which I will link in the description here. But this is even stronger in dungeons. It is at its best in multi-target scenarios. And the other two options that you see here, I've seen a lot of debate on what you run. And I will acknowledge that there is some merit to incinerate for single target, like raid builds. It's not as good as a lot of people seem to think it is, but it is pretty strong when you are able to reliably get the buff and especially if you're only tanking one mob and you're not getting that much pushback, this is not a bad ability to use. However, I've seen people try to run this in dungeons, and it just does not work. Do not run Incinerate. If you're tanking multiple mobs, you're going to get so much pushback, you should not really be casting anything while tanking in dungeons as a warlock tank. All of your stuff should be instant, so this just won't be worth it. And your only real source of fire damage comes from Searing Pain. Sure, at the start of like raid pulls, you can get an Immolate off, even dungeon bosses, you can start with an Immolate, but it's going to amount to a very low portion of your damage, so most of your fire damage comes from Searing Pain, which is pure single target. And you are going to be in dungeons still tab targeting Searing Pain. That is something that you will try to do at points, but that is not where most of your threat will come from. That is where Everlasting Affliction comes in. So just to reiterate this, in case you didn't read it earlier or you're unfamiliar with it, this makes it so your corruption effectively is infinite. A bunch of different spells, Drain Life, Drain Soul, Shadow Bolt, which is Shadow Cleave if you're in Metamorphosis, Searing Pain, Incinerate, and Haunt will all refresh your corruption on your current target. And this effectively means that up to like six to seven targets or something, you have infinite corruption the moment it's applied. So you apply it once at the start of like a trash pull, you put corruption on like five different targets, which I'll discuss talents in a bit more detail later, but obviously you're going to take five out of five improved corruption to make it instant cast. If you are in dungeons, this is just a no brainer. There are some other options we'll talk about later, but this means that at the start of every single pull, you tab to every single different mob in the pack, apply corruption, and it will never fall off provided you are playing correctly. And that is largely because when you are in Metamorphosis, your Shadow Cleave will hit three targets, and Everlasting Affliction causes your corruption to be refreshed by Shadow Cleave. So every time you press this, even though the threat and the damage on this isn't amazing, it's not bad, and you're refreshing three corruptions at once. So you put Drain Life on one person with Master Channeler, that refreshes a corruption. You Shadow Cleave, that refreshes three more. Then if there's a few more, if it's a really large pull, you just tab Searing Pain like you would in any other build. And now you have Corruption rolling on multiple targets, you don't need to refresh it. All those GCDs that you would have had to spend refreshing Corruption, you can instead reapply Curse of Agony, you can spend more Searing Pains, or as we mentioned, you can do Searing Cleave basically on cooldown, or Shadow Cleave rather, because it is solid damage if you're hitting three targets. And it is, of course, refreshing a corruption on three targets with every hit. So it is a very powerful combo. Like I said, if you're going to take away anything from this video, run Everlasting Affliction. It is absolutely worth the supply crate farm to get this rune. It is criminally underrated by every single player out there. This is not the only tip I have for the video, but I will admit it is the biggest one by far. Because this is absolutely crucial in dungeons. Uh, I should also note Demonic Grace. This is another thing that I've seen many people running. It is not bad, it is definitely better than Incinerate for dungeons. So if you 
for whatever reason don't have Everlasting Affliction, you can get away with running Demonic Grace, but it is considerably worse. The main thing about this is, while it is a okay damage cooldown, that's really not the reason you'd ever run it, so you're only ever running Demonic Grace for the 30% dodge. 30% dodge is not terrible, in fact it is decent survivability if you're tanking multiple mobs, but it just doesn't really do a lot. Your survivability as a Warlock, especially against like physical attacks, which is the only thing dodge would really help, is already really good. Your armor is fantastic. Generally speaking, spell casts are the only thing that you'll even struggle with as a Warlock tank for like survivability, and Demonic Grace doesn't really help you with that, so this doesn't really do a whole lot. It's definitely weaker than having infinite corruption on multiple targets. Okay, so that covers the runes. Now let's talk talents. Already mentioned, 5 out of 5 points in improved corruption, and any Warlock player knows, obviously, 2 points into improved life tap. This is absolutely mandatory. I know some people may think, oh well, you know, I can get away with taking other stuff instead of improved life tap because I'm not really going to be life tapping in combat as a Warlock tank. No, you should be. Uh, your Metaform already gives you an improvement to your Life Tap. You can see right towards the top there, your Mana Gain from Life Tap is increased by 100%. So this just boosts that by even more. You're always going to want a Life Tap. I know it's a little bit scary using your health as a resource if you're actively taking mobs, and it can make your healer a little bit stressed. I've definitely had situations where I've had my healer rage at me because I've been a little bit too aggressive with life tapping. Guys, That's mana is fucking terrible. Especially yeah. around Lonnie. What? Especially around Lonnie. What? Good well, you healed me, let me just life tap all that away. Ha ha ha. But all that aside, it is definitely worth running this talent. This is a guaranteed two points. Even if it's just for the speed of the dungeon, right? Like not having to stop and drink between every single pull and being able to kind of convert some of your health into mana and then restore that health through drain life, especially with improved drain life, which you can see I'm running here. It is very powerful. A lot of times, even with like fairly minimal support from your healer, you can just sustain yourself entirely with drain life and, you know, even throwing in a few life taps there, you don't need to worry about it. So this is crucial. Now you can see I have one point here in Suppression. This is partially because this is also a build that I'm using for raiding. It's obviously this video is not geared towards raid builds, it's for dungeons. I would say in most cases though, it is still worth running at least one point in Suppression. And the nice thing is then you don't need to respec every single time you're going to run BFD. This is a pretty universal build, but it is especially good for dungeons. And Suppression is even more important if you're trying to do content like Razorfen Crawl because obviously those are either orange or in some cases red mobs, and increasing your hit chance for your corruption is very important. And the nice thing about that is, especially for higher level content, Everlasting Affliction is even stronger, because the moment you land it, as long as you don't resist every single one of your abilities past that, which does happen sometimes on red mobs, but usually won't happen on orange mobs, that saves you a million attempts of trying to refresh it on five different mobs at once, it will save you a ton of mana, save you a ton of GCDs. Overall, it just makes the dungeon run so much smoother. So I would say if you are trying to do high level content, you could maybe even put more points into this, but one point into suppression, I would say is always going to be nice if you're doing the higher level dungeons like Stockades, Razorfen, etc. And for other talents, so these are the only mandatory ones. Your flex points are then either going into improved drain life. This one is a no-brainer pretty much right you put on master channeler drain life it gives you a ton of healing it is slightly more damage oriented even though it does give you healing because this is coming at the cost of demonic embrace i would say if you are really scared maybe if you're not quite as geared and you're worried about your health obviously five points into demonic embrace is good the spirit loss doesn't mean anything spirit really doesn't matter to you at all as a warlock and personally this is the build that i would recommend but i will acknowledge there are some other talents that you can take. So if you have taken 5 points into Demonic Embrace, there are a few things that I would say are worth running in the Demonology tree. For starters, Improved Imp, and I think this is a good chance to talk about pets, which is another major thing that I think a lot of people are doing wrong. So you might wonder, well, why would I take 3 points in Improved Imp when obviously, you know, I'm taking the pet tank, Voidwalker, and for a lot of you... I'm about to tell you that Santa Claus isn't real, because the unfortunate reality of Voidwalker is that it's just not very good. 
And I have had this discussion with so many people since I started tanking on a Warlock, and it's something that I've kind of already seen, even with people playing DPS Warlock prior. They just don't really understand how bad this thing is in Classic. Now, for solo questing, like in Original Classic prior to Season of Discovery, Voidwalker is okay, right? Like, if you aren't blowing all your stuff and you're just putting up dots and letting your Voidwalker tank a mob, like if you're doing hardcore and you're playing super duper ultra safe, yes, having a tank in your pocket is kind of nice. But the Voidwalker doesn't actually give you anything. So what it does is torment this will taunt a mob, right? It will give you consume shadows. This like lets it restore its health. So you're not having to use effectively health funnel after every single pull. Not really that good, honestly. And then suffering is an AOE taunt on a two minute cooldown. Now, the two minutes means it's not that great as is. I mean, you have Demonic Howl already, and I sometimes go entire dungeons without really needing to use this. This obviously is a 10 minute cooldown, this is two minutes, but still. The main issue with the Voidwalker is that it cannot really hold threat. In order to even make it work as like a solo leveling tank pet, you need to intentionally gimp your damage just so that this will take threat off the mob and you're just rotting it with your dots while the Voidwalker builds its threat. It doesn't actually help you hold mobs in a dungeon, because either you're going to take threat off your own Voidwalker, and it gives you personally nothing other than, I know some people are screaming at me to say, Sacrifice gives you a shield for, uh, what is it, like 513 damage? That's maybe a little over half my health. Honestly, it's not really that necessary. It's kind of the same deal with Demonic Embrace. Like, if there are cases where survivability in dungeons is a huge concern, you could, technically speaking, argue that running Voidwalker for Sacrifice is nice, but you also have, like, tons of other options. Honestly, Orb of Soren Rook is really nice, consistent healing for some of the more difficult dungeon pulls. I have a better orb that I usually swap to in the form of... This thing, Ivy Orb of Shadow Wrath, there's better drops in the raid that I just haven't seen, but frequently in dungeons, if this thing's off cooldown, I'll swap to it, and it's just a 30-minute cooldown that's really, really nice to have. Uh, if needed, you don't want to rely on extra planar spider silk boots, but theoretically, if there were ever a mechanic in a dungeon, which I find unlikely for Classic, that would be so scary that you really need the consume Voidwalker to survive, you just have options. You have healing potions, you have health stones. It's never going to make the difference between living or dying unless your healer is really bad, and more importantly, it's just never going to be able to reliably hold threat. So, okay, Voidwalker's bad. I've already made that clear. I'm sure some people are just complete Voidwalker simps and will never agree with me, but hopefully maybe some of you will start to realize that it's not as good as you maybe historically thought it was. But if you're not running Voidwalker, what are you running? And that's where it comes down to either Imp or Succubus. Both of them are very good for different reasons. A lot of times I like to just run Succubus because it's pretty straightforward. It is the best damage pet. Really not much more to it than that. Succubus has some nice utility at higher levels that we currently don't have access to. But right now you can see all I have is Soothing Kiss, which reduces the chance that the Succubus gets attacked. It doesn't really matter at all because it rarely rips threat. And Lash of Pain is just good damage. This is still probably going to beat the Imp in terms of damage on multiple targets. None of your pets really are good for AoE, but the Succubus will do the most boss damage. It'll usually do the most just hitting a single mob on AoE pulls. And that's just kind of nice to have, right? Obviously, if the mobs die faster, then you take less damage. Pretty straightforward. The reason to run the Imp over the Succubus, and there are a lot of good reasons to this, and I would actually say in most cases this is the better pet, is because of its utility. Because if the Voidwalker isn't actually tanking, so that's not useful, and it's doing effectively no damage, and the shield isn't useful, and if you don't really care about the extra damage from the Succubus, the Imp has a lot of really nice tools. For starters, Blood Pact. This is 9 stamina, so 90 health to your entire group. So realistically, in terms of survivability, this is almost just better than having the shield from the Voidwalker. Is the Voidwalker shield, then you have to consume it, and then it's dead for the rest of the pull, and then you'd have to do it, you know, revive it after, and that's a soul shard wasted, which, like, technically doesn't matter, but it's just annoying. And who really wants to have to resummon their Voidwalker and spend a soul shard every time? It sucks. I hate soul shards, but, you know, we gotta do what we gotta do. But the nice thing about the Imp is this is no soul shards, and it's just a flat 9 stamina for every single person in your party, yourself included. 
So this is definitely the most utility for your group. It is pretty good survivability for yourself. And the imp's damage is really not that bad. It's not succubus, but it's not terrible. More importantly, if you do not have a druid in your group, I would say the imp is almost always the best option because of fire shield. This, I, I don't know exactly what the internal cooldown is. Uh, it definitely does not proc infinitely, but it procs pretty frequently. It's shared with thorns, so if you're familiar with how thorns works, this is pretty much the same, and it is pretty good, especially if you have any fire spell power or magic damage things, which, you know, most warlocks have a decent amount on themselves in their gear. And this is definitely good if you do not have a druid. In fact, if you don't have thorns from somebody in your group, the imp is actually going to be more damaged, most likely, than the succubus, because this is just really good if you're tanking multiple mobs. So... I would say there is just no reason to run the Voidwalker. Either of these ones can be good. A lot of times I have a Druid friend who I run with, so I tend to just not really value the Imp as much, but if I was not running with him, I would almost always be running the Imp just for Fire Shield. And also Blood Pact is just really good. Which, with all of that out of the way, I do think Pet Choice was a very important thing to discuss. If you want to put three points into Improved Imp, if this is something you are consistently running, this actually may be better than Improved Drain Life. As I said, I don't value it super highly because I usually have a Druid friend who I've been doing dungeons with, and therefore I have Thorns, so I don't need an Imp, so I don't need three points into Improved Imp. But this means that you're getting even more stamina from Blood Pact, you're getting an even better Fire Shield, and the Imp is doing slightly more damage. Whereas the Void Walker, this makes your shield slightly better? Like, it, it doesn't really improve the effectiveness of its taunts. I, I'm actually not quite sure what the uh, improvement on Torment and Suffering does in this case. I would imagine it improves the hit chance, so it has a lesser chance of being resisted, but it's not so much that the Voidwalker isn't able to taunt the mobs, like it can do that, but the way that threat works in Classic, it's almost always going to lose threat immediately to any decent DPS in your group. And if you're watching this video based on the title and thumbnail, it's probably because you're struggling to hold threat. And that's because you're probably running with mages or even rogues, like on a single target scenario. Or, of course, hunters, like with explosive shot and stuff, constantly ripping threat off you. And if they're ripping threat off you without Voidwalker, yeah, your Voidwalker doesn't stand a chance. It's going to maybe taunt the mobs for a second, and then it's going to immediately lose threat again. So who cares if these things are slightly better? This effectively should just read... The shield that you get from sacrificing your Voidwalker is slightly bigger. I'm sorry, it just it really is not that important. Uh, unfortunately, unless you invest all of your points, uh, you can't actually take Improved Succubus, which, you know, it would be kind of nice to have if it was earlier up, but it's nowhere near good enough to invest all these points in. So if you are running Imp, this is something you could do, but otherwise I wouldn't recommend investing further points. Uh, there is also... An argument to be made, I will at least say that, you know, having Shadow Bolt uh, or Improved Shadow Bolt here will make your Shadow Cleave cause, specifically critical strikes, increase the shadow damage dealt to your target. And effectively, this is making it so your Corruption and Curse of Agony is dealing, I guess, 4% per uh, point you put into this talent for 12 seconds after you hit them with a Critical Strike Shadow Cleave. And obviously, if you're running the Everlasting Affliction build, you will be using Shadow Cleave. I know some builds opt to not press it, but when you're refreshing three corruptions at once, this is quite good. I just think it's too much of an investment. It's like if you really wanted to completely sacrifice your survivability, you could like drop three points in Demonic Embrace or drop all of Improved Drain Life and take that. But personally, I feel this is just barely negligible it's you're not even going to notice the damage increase and it's giving you no survivability so i would not recommend it but it is an option okay and the last thing i want to talk about as far as the build goes is gear and this is slightly irrelevant because obviously while leveling up while gearing up while doing dungeons especially before you enter bfd your gear is just going to be whatever you manage to get right like i can tell you hey this necklace from bfd is really good that doesn't really matter if you haven't actually done BFD yet. So that's not why I want to discuss gear. Really, the main thing I want to talk about here is stuff like Invoker's Mantle, spell damage, or uh, shadow damage, or I'm actually wearing my shadow damage, or no, it's here. So your shadow damage cape, right? Uh, I've seen so many different Warlock tank guides that 
just don't really mention plus shadow damage. They're like, oh yeah, incinerate Lake of Fire, this is so good. And this is kind of what I said before, I want to touch upon this again. Your damage from fire, when you're tab targeting Searing Pain, it is not really going to be that good. In the vast majority of cases, when you are doing a dungeon, your damage breakdown will be dominated by Corruption, by Curse of Agony, by Drained Life. And Searing Pain will be on there, but it will not make up a significant portion of your damage. So, spending a ton of mana on Lake of Fire just to get 40% increase to fire damage, 40% more Searing Pain damage, it seems like a lot, but not only is that a huge mana investment, it's just not really going to result in that much of a damage increase, and if you are following all of those guides that are erroneously recommending that you stack plus fire damage in all forms of content, you're missing out on benefits that affect all of your other sources of damage, which even if they aren't more than Searing Pain or Incinerate in like a single target setting, they're still going to be about like 30% of your overall, and especially in dungeons, it amounts to a lot. So my rule of thumb when I am gearing is that if I am getting more than half of the raw spell damage from a piece compared to how much of a single school I can get, I will take the plus spell damage. So, for instance, shoulders in this slot, uh, they are either going to be plus 11 fire damage or plus 11 shadow damage if you get the absolute best possible maxed out rolled green. Comparatively, Invoker's Mantle gives you 7 magical spells damage, and this applies to both shadow and fire. So effectively, you're getting 7 shadow damage, 7 fire damage, for a total of effectively plus 14, if you want to think about it like that, uh, damage to your different schools. Because most of the time, your damage breakdown is going to be like a kind of 50-50 split between shadow and fire, if you are running the build that I'm talking about here. And if you're only running plus fire damage, you're neglecting a huge part of the rest of your kit, and especially in dungeons, if you have to pick, like you can see here, I have Durable Cape of Fiery Wrath, plus 9 Fire Spell Damage, and Elder's Cloak of Shadow Wrath, plus 9 Shadow. They're effectively the exact same, just one boost Fire, one boost Shadow. If you're doing dungeons, always take the Shadow Damage. Ideally, you would take Magic, but there's really no good plus Spell Damage Cloak. You really can only get these greens that give you plus to a specific school, and when in doubt for dungeons, Shadow Damage is king. Now, we've covered everything related to the build itself, but I want to end on a quick note about kind of how this is going to play out. You may have already figured this out, but I kind of said you're keeping corruption up on a ton of different targets. It's a very shadow damage focused build. It should all make sense, but I think one of the main points that I want to make, which I think is more so the way that people approach tanking a classic is flawed, or the way that new players approach tanking a classic is flawed, especially if they're coming from retail. So in retail World of Warcraft, you should never really lose threat. You enter a pull, you press your buttons, and you have threat on every single bob. That is just not the case in Classic. In Classic, sometimes you're going to be tanking like two-thirds of the mobs, and the other third are going to be hitting your DPS. And if they are hitting your DPS for the entire pull, that's bad. But if they're only hitting your DPS for like the first few seconds of a pull, it doesn't really matter. Like, they don't do enough to one-shot DPS players, they're going to be auto-attacking them for a little bit. They may drop to half health in really dire situations, but as long as you eventually establish threat on everything, and nobody is in danger of dying, and, you know, you kill the mobs, that is all that really matters. So I think a lot of people are approaching Warlock tanking, and that I need to have threat on everything immediately. And I've heard so many stories from people saying that they're trying to go into dungeons, put up Reign of Fire, put up uh, Incinerate, and then spam tab target Searing Pain. And I'll read comments like, oh, there's just no AoE threat. Like, I hope we get Immolation Aura because, like, I just can't hold threat. Spam tab targeting Searing Pain. That's all Warlocks can do right now. And it just blows my mind because, no, you have so many other ways that you can establish threat. It's just you can't expect to get it immediately. I should note, I've heard a lot of the suggestions about Immolation Aura. I also think that sounds awesome. I would love to have... Warlock tank be more like Demon Hunter, but we still have ways, as shown here, to hold AoE threat, but it's not going to be immediate. Most pulls with this build start off slow. You're going to be tab targeting to a bunch of different mobs, applying Corruption, applying Curse of Agony. I usually start with Corruption just to get it built up on a lot of different targets, and also Corruption just does more damage at this level than Curse of Agony. And, you know, obviously, 
get your drain life up immediately the moment you start taking damage. You want to be healing that damage off. So I build all that up, and I will usually have threat in like one or two mobs. If one runs to my healer, I quickly, you know, tab target to it, taunt it, or if one's hitting a DPS, I'll try to like throw out a Searing Pain. But if there's like one mob hitting another DPS player, or maybe one is hitting my pet or something, I don't panic. I just keep building up all of my dots. And after 10, 15 seconds, especially on like a five mob pull, I will have Corruption and Curse of Agony and Drain Life up, and most mobs are rotting out. And my damage and by association my threat is through the roof. At that point, while I throw out a Shadow Cleave, I refresh the duration of Corruption, and then I just start tabbing. Tab Searing Pain, Tab Searing Pain, like those people that I talked about earlier said they were doing. Except now, not only am I tabbing Searing Pain and getting threat back in that mob, but I have Corruption rolling at full duration. And now, even if I didn't start immediately getting threat on five different mobs at once, I have built up my dots on so many mobs that I am now no longer going to lose threat. It doesn't matter how much that mage is pumping, how much that hunter is pumping, all of these mobs are rotted to hell, they are locked onto me, and my healer can just focus heals into me. So it takes a little bit of time to build that up, but once you get your dots going, you are not going to lose threat at all. And you just consistently do that every single pull. Maybe it's not for everybody, obviously dot management is not something that I personally love, but hey, it is effective. But anyways, I think I've covered pretty much everything that I wanted to say about how to tank in dungeons as a warlock. I will be doing probably a more detailed guide for raiding going forward. I did like a mini guide when I uploaded my full Black Fathom Deeps run, but I've gotten a lot of requests on describing more of like boss strategy stuff. Like what do I do on each boss? Like more detail on my build, especially I've made a few changes since that video. So I might do that. I'm also obviously doing a little bit of a different video format where I'm just sitting down and talking through all of my build choices instead of doing some heavily scripted thing, which I normally prefer to do, but I want to try this out. So I'm curious to hear what you thought. Uh, if you like this format and you want to see similar stuff going forward, let me know. If there are suggestions you have, changes that you would like me to make, then please feel free to suggest that in the comments. And also, of course, if you have any further questions on either Warlock tanking in dungeons or really anything to do with Warlock tanks. I've been playing this spec a lot since Season of Discovery started. I absolutely love it, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have with how this spec plays out. Um, but anyways, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would greatly appreciate it if you could toss it a like, as that'll help more people find the video. And I will catch you in the next one. Peace.